course I had to restart my computer. Y'all know how I am with technology. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I am super excited and we are very blessed with the presence of Jack Birkenstock Jr. who is our blessed. actual Ooh. pro today. <laughs> it's my boy Jack D.E. Bear. Hello, how are you? Hey, hey. Thank you for that follow, D.E. Bear. I appreciate you. Uh, so Jack Birkenstock Jr. is a master's level therapist who has worked in the human services field for 25 years. He's received his master's degree in human services in 2008 and has an extensive history before that working as a direct support professional. He has worked pre predominantly with at-risk children and adolescents in settings included inner city education, recreation, and residential treatment facilities. He specializes <laughs> and he vapes. There you go. He specializes in working with the victims of and perpetrators of sexually problematic behaviors. His work has also included supporting adults with intellectual development disability with sexually pro problematic behaviors. And all of these experiences also involved working with co-occurring mental health disorders. Jack is the executive director and one of the founders of the Bod Bod Bodhana, Bodana, uh, Bodana. It's Bodana, like the old, okay. like the old Richie Valen song. I got gotcha. okay. So the, Bo <laughs> the Bodana Group, a five hundred one C three organization that utilizes tabletop gaming for education, skill and building, skill building and therapy. Bodana is based in York, Pennsylvania, and I'm super excited to get to talk about Save Against Fear as well, which is a big production Ooh, yes. of the Bodana Group. So we don't have a lot to cover at all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> We're just going to hang out. Uh, so as you guys know, I have a queue. Anyone who is new here, if you have a question that you would like to put in, I will show you what that looks like. You type exclamation point, the letter Q, and then say, what is your favorite color? And it will give you a confirmation that it has been entered into the queue. One thing to note is that it is one question per person at a time. So if you try to ask two questions, it'll only add one in. Um, but like Alex could ask a question, DE Bear could ask a question, Bite Mark could ask a question, all of those will be on there. Um, and then as we go through, I'll make sure that those get answered. If they fit in with the conversation we'll answer them right away if not then we'll wait until the end whenever we kind of open it up to additional questions oh All look right. at that first hey, oh, question already what hey. is your favorite vape flavor uh actually I, I just got a bottle the other day uh it's a flavor called juice head uh and it is uh a pineapple that has a splash of grapefruit added and i'm actually uh just going to start to try zero milligrams of nicotine um been about two and a half years since I quit smoking. Courtesy of vape went from 18, currently at a three, trying out zero. So Congrats. hopefully uh, co completely lung ingested uh, materials free in about, you know, three to 27 months, give or take a year. So <laughs> that's fantastic. That is, that is amazing. That's really good. Uh, okay. So that's the cue. And now welcome. First of all, Jack, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, I, I love the questions that are lined up in the discussion. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. And again, thanks to uh, Mike Fields, my, uh, my bro from down south, uh, who was a guest uh, a few weeks ago uh, for connecting us. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, he mentioned you. Uh, he mentioned Save Against Fear. He had just come from the convention. So he was really excited and really pumped and happy to have gone. And um he just talked you up so much that whenever I said, well, who should I interview next that you know? And he said, you should get Jack Birkenstock. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I, I owe him a calzone. There you go. There you go. Uh, so D.E. Bear asked a question also. Do you have anything special planned for the 10th anniversary of Save Against Fear in 2020? Asking Ooh. for a friend. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I have no idea who a bear might indicate. Uh, I have no idea who that might be. Uh, yet we, we have a lot of great stuff planned. We're continuing our trend of providing professional offerings to therapists who want to use tabletop gaming in their practice and uh, in, their, in their group. So we are hot on the heels of sharing information and community with about 28 professionals from all across the country. Uh, and next year we're going to be adding a lot more uh, workshop content. We're also going to be uh, looking at getting a little bit more down and dirty with our special guests. So having folks actually like maybe giving advice to 
practitioners about how to include therapeutic and emotional content within their game systems, uh, as well as hopefully some special designer surprises, because again, it will be the 10th annual. So it's going to be a very, very huge celebration for us next year. So more to, more to follow. More, more to come. Sounds like we're going to have a lot of uh, announcements to follow after this, for sure. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. So uh, while we get into kind of all of this, we'll just start off with a softball question, uh, which sometimes winds up being one of the longest questions and and answer pieces actually for us. But why do you do what you do? What interests you in mental health and how did you get inspired to get into this field? Well, I wasn't cutting and selling appliances, so I figured, no, uh, uh, it's actually Fair. only a partial truth there. Um, no, I it, it, honestly, the, we often talk about like the reasons that people go into the mental health field, especially considering, you know, a lot of the challenges and difficulties that, you know, we deal with in, in helping people get to that, to that healing place. And it, for me, it's, I've always been fascinated by human behavior. I actually came from uh, somewhat of a chaotic childhood. Um, so, you know, being a child of a divorced household, there's also, uh, some in- inappropriate behavior that I was witness to when I was a very young child, um, which is all kind of reasons why I do what I do. So I actually turned a, uh, trauma survival set of behaviors into a career. Uh, I was kind of trained to be vigilant for crisis and, you know, to avoid the yelling and all of the hectic nature of, of fights and arguments and, you know, uncomfortable emotion in the house. So I kind of learned to self-manage and I was in a eldest brother role. So I kind of caretook my brothers and sisters, which then led to me being a caretaker in environments. So, I mean, it's also why throughout my career, I've also been a crisis response trainer and a crisis management specialist for, I think it's four different systems of crisis intervention that I was certified in throughout my career. So it it literally is that I was kind of unintentionally geared for the field through personal experience. So I kind of turned that into being able to help others find that, that center, if you will. So that, that's kind of what drives me, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something that um, we've seen in a pretty common manner here is just that a lot of mental health professionals, they experienced something that made them want to go um, into the field or they had a loved one who experienced something that made them want to go into a field um, and that's that's been a big driver for a lot of people like I experienced this and I want to help other people uh, so I think that that's that's a great explanation um, Alex has a question he says have you ever advised anyone to become a therapist and if so why hmm. uh, well I yeah I've advised quite a few people that I've that I've worked with and that are friends of mine over the years and usually why I kind of advise them is, is is it's that rare thing that like people think that the therapist's job is to tell people what to do. And I'm like, no, no, no. You're, you're, <laughs> the job of a therapist is, is to establish a rapport and a connection with someone so you can give them advice to let them think through what they are going through so they can kind of come to their own conclusion. So, you know, as opposed to, well, I give great advice. Well, that's great. That doesn't make you a good therapist. That actually makes you a person that might get annoying to people because we all have someone who, who gives it, you know, what you should do is blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the, the first, ironically, the first thing our brain does is actually shut that off because it's an external potential source of danger. So I had this little thing. It's a little kitschy, whatever, I, that I bought at a yard sale for like 15 cents. It says what some people need is a good listening to. And I, I really think that that's kind of at the heart of what prompts me to tell people to go into this field, that if you're, if you're good at listening without judgment and you can guide a person to self-reflect, that, that to me is the mark of a good therapist because I'm not, I'm not in your life 24 hours a day. And if I ask you a question or guide you to someone, something in a session or in group, group during group is easy. Therapy after group is where true therapy is. It's how you take this stuff out into the world. So if you're a person who just tells you what to do, they're not with you all the time. So it, it, it kind of doesn't work. So I, people that are good, uh, have good empathy, good listening skills, good compassion, but can also, you know, be very firm and direct because that's another part of therapy. We have to say, well, I think you're making a bad choice. And here's why I think that figure it out, take that back for what it's worth. But yeah, so I've, I've advised a lot of people too. I've also <laughs> advised quite a few people to please leave the field. I, I mean, not you know, I'm, I'm not the world's greatest gift to therapy. I, I, I do well, I get by, <laughs> 
but you know there are people who overshare their own experiences or there are people who put it too much so well you know what i would do in a situation i was like well that you're not them and it, mm -hmm. you know it's, well, what do you think you should do well, we'll think about that you know yeah hope that answers that question yeah i i feel like it did <laughs> alex that was a great question by the way thank you um yes. i I definitely do not envy your job. I don't envy the job of my therapist either. Every time I go see her, I feel like I should apologize. But <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, mental health professionals, they go through a lot and they, I feel like also they have to hold back a lot. And that is not something that many people can do. <laughs> uh, no, not, especially if it's something like if someone's really at, like exhibiting very egregious behavior or very challenging behavior, you know, there, there's, especially in crisis management situations like that human impulse of like if someone punches you or someone spits at you or throws something at you or whatever you know your adrenaline's going so you're constantly fighting all of this reptile brain you know caveman kind of ethics of you know protect and you got to go well okay this person's struggle is a little bigger than my ego at the moment so let me just step back and be be the person that they that they need me to be you know it's the platinum rule. Mm -hmm. Don't follow the golden rule, which is treat others as you would like to be treated, because I'm not you. So I follow the platinum rule. I'm going to treat you how you would like to be treated, because that's the best way for you. I love that. That's great. The platinum rule. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, have you had many cases where people feel like they need therapy, but do not think there is anything wrong with them? Uh, yeah, it, I, I think that goes to the stigma that surrounds mental health in general that, you know, it's, it's, we're very much trying to get away from what we would call the medical model, which is usually, I have a disease, I have a disorder, that's it, it's a broke, something's broke, and you need to fix it. Well, life isn't fixed, it's managed. Life mm -hmm. is not cured or solved, it's lived. So, you know, it, uh, I'm very much in my personal treatment ideology is Buddhist psychology which involves a lot of CBT practice and DBT of course is born from that and positive psychology and other different traditions. But the, the general idea is that you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. If you know, this is why the Joker looks weird having a smile all the time, you know, because it, it life isn't meant to always be happy, go lucky. You're going to have challenges and it's about, you know, sometimes you're just grab, grab hold of the board and ride the wave and wait till the crest is finished. Because sometimes if like depression and anxiety treatment, a lot of people are like, well, you got to conquer the depression or conquer the anxiety. Well, maybe right now you can, and that's okay to just survive it. So I, I think that when people have an impression that therapy is going to fix me, it incurs an automatic assumption, well, then I'm broken. You're not broken. It's one of the things I love about Buddhist psychology and Buddhist belief. You have everything you need to be happy and successful. We've just been told, and our brain actually tells us, that we are imperfect. Uh, there's a great book called, um, oh my God, The Misleading Mind, which is a great book talking about how, how our brains constantly are fooling us and tricking us and taking us down this false path of what's supposed to make us happy or why we should be unhappy and it's literally about challenging your own thought process, which is what mindfulness truthfully is. So it's, yeah, it's a, that, that I think is where it should start is just, no, I'm not here to fix you. Do you think you're broken? Mm -hmm. Why do you think you're broken? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the misleading mind, uh, that's another, mm -hmm. so I, I wrote it down. Well, my reading list just grows and grows every, every time <laughs> I do. <laughs> He's like, man, I'm never going to get through these. I'm reading one. I, I in no way work for Amazon. <laughs> just throwing that out. Or Barnes & Noble. Just throwing that out there. Well, if you do and you have an affiliate link, you can share it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. As I grab like a big fake novelty check that says Amazon right. on it and put it over here. There Sorry. <laughs> Uh, D.E. Bear has a question. He said, or they, they say, I apologize. Uh, what is the most rewarding experience you've had using oh, games wow. as a therapeutic aid? Wow, great, great question. Uh, we were we were running a group for about five kids. They're all uh, young boys aged between 10 to 14. And we were running an adventure as a grief and loss uh, uh, group experience. So it was, it was very unique where most of our experiences with games is like we're running for like social skills or life skills or social anxiety or, or, or something about that. So when we were running this, it was actually a very short burst, kind of almost like an experiment. 
And so what we did was, you know, we created this like very heavy trope laden, like it, it was like the first 10 minutes of up is the joke that I usually like to say, because it was just so much, it was all about loss. It was all about, you know, saying goodbye. And the, the whole adventure was just this wonderful, uh, amazing adventure. The kids were following this inventor because the inventor knew it was his time to go. And he wanted to go through the lands of Storia because we were using No Thank You Weevil for Monty Cook. And as they went through each world, each world had a challenge that involved loss. So, you know, one of my favorite funny moments is they went to uh, Castle Karaoke and they had to participate in a Monsters Ball karaoke competition. And they had to sing a song about loss. So the kids, like, bear in mind, we're running this, and this is one of the ways that we do the, a lot of our groups, is we're running out of a game store. So we didn't use real names. This was all character names. We didn't stop every five minutes and go like, okay, so our therapeutic exercise, Johnny, you know, it was just we're playing a game, we're having fun the way that everybody else in the store is. So in the midst of a crowded game store, these these groups of like normally the two pool for school age kids, you know, between 10 and 14, mm -hmm. they created a song <laughs> about the lost island of Storia and how it sank beneath the waves and we we want to go back there but we can never go back like and i tell stories like this when we go to conferences and conventions like i should pass out tissues you know <laughs> but it was just so beautiful seeing these kids come up with a song in like 10 to 15 minutes and they sang it openly in front of this total room of strangers and the facilitators are like this is like it, it's amazing how much they're opening up through this and, and i'm like but it's a game and they have to do this to get through uh because like we we gave them like schlocky examples like a a vampire who was singing like this this uh, like song about having lost his fangs so he can't drink blood anymore and like a werewolf who was singing this like 20s <laughs> 30s like dirge about you know the moon i love it but it goes away but it'll be back someday you know like this whole cheesy thing uh, and then our favorite little joke was the opening act where a bunch of uh, serpent rappers uh, NWA Nagas with uh. attitude <laughs> so oh that's good uh, yeah so I mean it's it's the whole just in general that whole group it was so amazing because we actually ran it as a post assessment the kids had already gone through group and we ran this adventure to help test their ability to talk about their grief and loss and the loss of a primary parent. And it, we did all of this. It was only five weeks long. And, and it was just amazing how much that game, a game that none of those kids had played before. In truth, none of them even played an RPG before. And how they immediately locked into that series and, and that, uh, that system of play and how that opening up because we were being silly i mean we were mm -hmm. doing voices and whatever so it was just it was just very amazing that's one of my favorite groups that we've ever run was was that group for olivia's house which is a, a local agency that works with children and families oh that's great uh okay so we have another question so what is your suggestion for guiding someone to therapy that might be resistant to the idea um I, I think a lot of it is, is, is really not forcing a person into it, but helping a person understand like, well, what is it in your life that you'd like to change, if anything? What is it, where is it that you're struggling? And I, I think the biggest part is, is really rapport. Um, it, because one of the big things we talk about with any treatment modality is like you have so many different ways and systems and approaches. You have you know, REBT, CBT, DBT, you know, every T mm -hmm. in the absolute universe, right? Okay. And people are like, well, which one's the best one? And which is the research driven blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, it, with some exception <laughs> where, where we talk about like, you know, like EMDR or something that, you know, is like a very focused approach. Mm -hmm. It really, the biggest thing is the, is the rapport with your clinician, your provider, your therapist. Because if I like you, I'm going to buy into what you're telling me and I'm going to trust that you're there for me. So I would say that one of the biggest thing is to help a person find a therapist or a practitioner that they connect with, even if it's something like you both like Doctor Who or, you know, you're both into sci-fi flicks or, you know, you love the music of Justin Bieber. I don't know, whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever the reason is, this will really help you lock in 
with that person, which I think will then make them more amenable to treatment because then it doesn't seem stodgy or forced. Or, yeah. So that's what I would say to get them to it. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's great. And the the individual that Alex is talking about specifically, um, I I don't know if you're gonna I don't know if you're gonna make that happen, but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Hold All on right. How to get somebody to go to therapy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question, and this is going to sound a little weird, unrelated, but after our very first guest here on the show <laughs> talked about her super, um, talked about her super passion for true crime and serial killers. And then the very next guest also talked about a passion for serial killers. <laughs> I have started asking most of the professionals that I have on here whether or not they have a favorite serial killer. So do Ooh. you have a favorite serial killer? Uh, I have. I'm, I'm actually interested to see that if at some point you're going to put like a leaderboard to see like if certain <gasps> ones are the predominant favorite. That is a like, great idea. <laughs> like, like tally everyone's favorites and go, okay, currently in the running is so-and-so. Um Wow, that what I well thinking about it, I actually have two that are kind of constantly like warring with each other it's for different here. reasons. I know oh, you can't read awesome. it, but it, oh, there you go, criminal oh, leader. That is mm -hmm. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> uh, is is I'm kind of torn on one side. I really, really have always been fascinated with Ed Gein. Mm. Um, just it, it, just the fact that if you see interviews with him. And, you know, you kind of like chat with him. He he wasn't a malevolent spirit. Mm -hmm. He was just, I, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Like what was, because then you have like the whole thing of like the over-religious background and, you know, just like where he lived. But then the fear, the ferocity of his crimes and just how out there all that stuff was for like, what was it, Wisconsin back in the 50s like you that didn't happen then that was all yeah it did we just didn't have youtube to talk about it like so so he's one and then the other just because of the sheer i guess malevolent brilliance would probably be hh H. holmes just for the whole idea mm -hmm. of the murder castle and the insurance scams and all this stuff uh so yeah i'd say that those are probably my two fascinating but as a close third would probably be albert fish because again, uh, just the fascination with all of the, uh, he had a lot of sexual crimes that he committed and it was, it, he was another very interesting case of like the product of a very, very aberrant upbringing. Um, so yeah, the, the really out there ones, I guess. Yep. But if I had to pick one, Ed would probably be my number one. Okay. All right, so our, our next question is, is there a movie or show that you feel almost everyone should watch related or unrelated to your field? And yes, by Mark, I agree. A serial killer leaderboard is absolutely necessary. <laughs> and believe me, it is going to happen. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Um, I actually, uh, The Woodsman is, is a movie that I would say that is related to my field. It's a movie starring Kevin Bacon. And uh, Most Deaf is also in it starting as a probation officer for Kevin Bacon. And the whole idea is he is a uh, child molester who is released. And you're following this, his journey as he gets out of like trying to adjust to civilian life. And, you know, you're never quite sure if he's trying to protect this little girl or if he's predating a, a, against this little girl mm -hmm. but the reason that i like it is it shows a lot of the realities of a person who wants to get better because there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about people with sexually problematic behaviors you know we have this ideology in our mind of like this you know leering trench coat wearing like you know dripping with malevolent right. sweat kind of pervert thing where no um we have people that, you know, we were actually learning that to a large degree, sexual interest in the brain towards children or animals or something at that point, it's kind of set into the brain. It's no different from someone who likes blondes or someone who likes redheads or, you know, if someone likes guys who dress like firemen, you know, it's, we know what happens in the brain when we get stimulated. We don't know why it happens. So, I, but I love The Woodsman. It's actually a movie that we use for groups a lot. Uh, to help the guys recognize cognitive distortion and thinking errors that we're teaching them about. We also use it as a good way, <clears throat> you know, especially if you have intrafamilial offense, 
which is actually the most common. You're, uh, the, the number, it's about 92% of all offenses happen by someone who is known to the victim. Uh, 76 of those 92 are a family member. Wow. So when people talk about stranger danger, stranger danger, well, sorry, that's, right. that's not it's, the way it happens. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Uncle Joe and no one's to talk about mm-hmm. Uncle Joe because no one wants to break up the family or it's, or it's dad or it's mom. Yeah. And, you know, sets a lot of pressure on a victim. That's why a lot of stuff gets underreported. This is also why most things on Megan's Law are not actually child predation. It's mostly date rape, spousal abuse, and, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. But, yeah, The, the Woods has been an incredible movie. Mm-hmm. So, good so, question. Yeah, Alex had the same question, but sh- uh, should read book. And he also said that's weird because Kevin Bacon played a molester in Sleepers as well. Yep. Wow, that is... Is someone watching him? No, I'm just saying, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, Gallo sense of humor is, a, is another part of, uh, it's another byproduct of working in this field. People are like, oh my God, you monster. <laughs> it's welcome here. Trust me, it's welcome. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was Fat Guy Squared. I'm sorry. I apologize. That was not Alex that said that. Uh, but Alex did ask the same question, but a should read book that you feel like everyone should read related or unrelated Ooh. to your field. Uh, Moral Panic by Patrick Jenkins. Uh, yeah, I got, I got books for days. I know. Um, yeah, it's it's an excellent book that talks a lot about some of the background politics when we talk about things like stranger danger and like mothers in the workforce. And it's he, it's very interesting the way that Patrick breaks down a lot of these social panaceas and the pandemics that we have in 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 the factor of when we look at when they occurred so you know if you're talking about like during world war ii no one no one cared about stranger danger because mom had to work in the factory while dad was off at war yeah. kids ran amok um so then we started at that point we then started focusing on you know one aspect of this but then when we got into like the 60s and 70s with women's lib and women started entering into the workforce then all of a sudden it was no no we can't leave our kids at home because of stranger danger even though the statistics of intrafamilial abuse that you know sexual abuse is america's worst best kept secret so then once that took a turn and then it started to be, you know, more equal and both parents were at home. Like it's, it's just fascinating to see. It, it's like when I read a uh, book called Understanding Satan, which was all about the Salem witch trials. And when you learn the underpinning of, you know, not only the, the uh, wheat infection that, you know, caused hallucination stuff, but like so many of those things were, I want your land. So I'm going to say you're a witch. So that way I get to steal your land. And like there was so much politics and infighting and all this stuff that surrounded all of these panics that people get engaged in. It's just very interesting to take a look back and go, why are there patterns? And why do we have this consistent pendulum flow of trends, especially in the mental health field? Because even now, like we got people talking about Megan's Law and how Megan's Law is not at all what Megan's mother originally intended. And we're finding in certain aspects that it's not working to catch the people who are doing most of the abuse, but people feel safe. It's, it's security theater. It's like extra people at the airport. It's not really doing much because if you're not reporting abuse, we're not tracking the people. So the people who are still predating are not being caught. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the book you mentioned is moral panic. Is it changing concepts of the child molester in modern America? Is that the right one? Uh, yes. Okay. Philip Jenkins. Yep. Okay. Yeah, cool. phenomenal book. By Mark pulled the link for me. I just wanted to make sure. Hey, Flay of Creations, right. how are you? Yep. Uh, now, you've mentioned Megan's Law a couple times. Can you just tell us what that is? Uh, sure. Uh, Megan's Law is a uh, classification and alert system that they use. Uh, virtually every state has one. Uh, and the whole idea behind Megan's Law is that if you have a person who has been caught for one or more sexual <laughs> offenses, uh, the person goes on to Megan's Law, and there's typically uh, multiple tiers. So you may have like tier one, which is very minor or introductory offenses. They'll usually get like 10 years on Megan's Law, and that typically requires a person to have to go in quarterly to the police station. You get updated photographs. You got any new tattoos, uh, but your picture and your address and such are posted online. Uh, mm. Now, the unfortunate thing about this is um, we run into multiple different stories and encounters where, you know, if someone engages in a behavior when they're at a young age, the, 
the predilection of people to think is, well, because you engage in this very egregious behavior, which again, I'm not at all arguing that sexual offenses is not a special type of, of right. criminal behavior. But what I'm saying is, is that there are multiple reasons why people engage in this behavior. Sex is not the purest motivator. Uh, or as I always used to say, sex is, is, is not the destination, it's the vehicle. So I've worked with children and teens who offend because they were offended. I work with kids and teens who offend because they, they want emotional attention and validation. Uh, I've uh, engaged with people who did it pure for revenge, and it was the quickest way to get a, a, a reaction out of people or out of the family. You want to hurt someone, you're going to hurt them in the most, uh, you know, in, intended way that's going to cause the most damage. And, and it, there's multiple layers of how people need to be worked through that. But the problem is that there are people, like there was a statistic I read, and I wish I remembered the study offhand, but it's, it was something like 83 to 87% of juveniles who offended sexually did not reoffend wow. without, the aid of, without the aid of treatment. So wow. they didn't go through treatment. They didn't go through, they got, they got caught. They got a consequence. They were educated. They were good. Yeah. And people are like, well, but you know, once an offender, always an offender. Like this is stuff I was trained on. Like this was my one-on-one when I started in the field. And we've learned so much like shame and guilt treatment doesn't work what works is well let's help you build a healthy life and part of that healthy life is yeah. let's get you into a community so now you care about people that could be potential victims but no what we do is nimby not in my backyard so we're going to move everybody to the next little sh you know offender shanty town and the problem is yes your neighborhood doesn't have to worry about it but someone's neighborhood does and you now have a disenfranchised population that doesn't care about you yeah. Um, again, explanations, not excuses. Right. It, it's just a natural way that this falls down. And, and it's a shame that we feel secure where the biggest way to engender a person to get to a better life is to help them at least believe they have a better life possible. Yeah. And unfortunately, the way that we push people away doesn't really give that person the opportunity. Yeah. Well, and one of the biggest things that, um, because before I do these interviews, especially on a topic that I'm not familiar with, um, I always make sure to, to do some research. So one of the biggest things that, I, that kept coming up um, over and over was that child offenders are children too, and they need to be treated as children. I mean, they're still kids. And that yeah. doesn't mean that there doesn't be, need to be something done or some intervention, um, but you got to remember that they're, they're kids and not monsters until you make them into monsters. Flav, uh, if you have something that's unrelated to mental health right now, you can stick around until after the interview. Happy to talk to you after about that for sure. <laughs> Zeus. Oh my God. All right. I'm a sucker for a good pun. So is butt cheeks one word or should I spread them apart? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I love it. I'm, I'm such a, such a sucker for a pun. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's good, Zeus. I like it. Uh, that's why I'm waiting. No worries, Flav. No worries. All right. So in your bio, um, you mentioned your work with at-risk kids, including inner city education, recreation, mm -hmm. residential treatment facilities. Do you find that there's a really significant difference in the problems facing inner city versus rural or sub suburban youth? <sighs> Uh, that places them at risk or in, in maybe in different ways or more at risk or less at risk? Uh, to, to be honest, um, not really. Uh, one of the, where we're specifically talking about like sexually problematic behavior, one of the interesting things is there there is no stone cold profile. Like there is no, I can point to this, like there are trends and qualities. So if you talk about, well, you know, kids who are unsupervised might be a, a connective factor. Well. If you got a rural community where everybody's working like in a farm environment or they're working at this job, they can be just as unsupervised as, you know, from a mom and dad who worked three or four jobs in the inner city. Um, in terms of like criminogenic, I mean, even though they're not true reality, I mean, you got just as much criminal activity out in the sticks right. as, you, as you do in the city. Right. You know, your drug of choice may be a little different uh, if we're talking about something like that. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're, in, in terms of sexually problematic, the biggest factor that probably is the worst contributor that we've seen, and this extends also to adults with disability, is lack of education and proper healthy sexual development. Mm. Um, sex is such a taboo. 
in our country. It, it, I mean, pardon me for getting on my yeah. soapbox here for a second. By all means, it, please. It, it, it literally, it makes me sick how twisted we are as a country and, and as a culture about sex that, you know, okay, girls, now you're taught to keep it as long as you possibly have to hold on to it. But guys, man, get it as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the one, one's a stud and the other is a whore. And it, it, it's, so we're automatically set up culturally to be at this divergence or this diffusion where we, we have different goals. And then we wonder why relationships don't work out. Well, go right. figure. We've, yeah. we've set you up for war. We've even told you which are the black and which are the white pieces on the board. Um, so when we talk then about like if it's persons with disability and it's, and it's literally like, well, who, I, had, I had a parent ask me one time, well, who put this idea on my son's head that he could have sex? And I was like, biology <laughs> I, I mean i'm i'm trying not to be a smarty pants here but mm -hmm. quite simply that that's a biological imperative it's something we all have to figure out how much of it we want how little of it or whether or not we want it at all but we don't talk about that ah, you'll figure it out and then we wonder why we get so many teenagers who get into trouble for sexting naked pictures of themselves to each other. Well, that never happened in my day. Well, of course not. You traded Polaroids. It was different right. technology. You know, from the moment we found we could paint on cave walls, we painted boobs and penises. Like <laughs> it, it, we're obsessed with sex because it's yes. more of a biological imperative, right? But we don't talk about it in a mature way because either, oh, that kid won't understand it. Well, not until you tell them about it. Sure, mm -hmm. of course. I don't understand astrophysics until I take a course on it. <laughs> right. You know, it's really not that much different. So, yeah, yeah. education is the big piece. <laughs> Sorry, soapbox there. No, no, <laughs> you're you're totally fine, and I completely agree and, and understand what you mean. I mean, the it's the don't talk about it, and when we talk about it, it's so completely different. Depending on who you're talking to, who's the one doing the talking, you're told one thing in school and you're going to be told just biology, but then girls are told one thing and boys are told another thing. Yep. It's totally up to the parents to, to figure out what else they want to say, if anything. And then well, you have to figure out where are they getting their information from if they're not getting it from parents. And it's just, it's a mess. Well, and, it, and it's also, I think people also kind of remembering that, you know, children learn a lot from what they're shared and what we tell them. So we have to be very careful about not injecting our own personal experience. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, getting sexual advice from a divorced parent is so, so much worse than anyone else giving you advice. Because like, you know, the advice that I got when I was young was kind of bitter and kind of filled with yeah. anger and hate and it was like well okay if your first time was was horrible that doesn't mean that your daughter or son's first time isn't going to be wonderful right. could you not make it horrible before they even get to the dance like could calm down you know yeah. yes Tyrion's being Tyrion. andy's wet because he got in the shower with my husband <laughs> so he's a it's kind of it's kind of gross to pet him when he's wet on his head because it feels <laughs> so your specialization is working with victims and perpetrators of sexually problematic behaviors can you kind of define those in both youth and then also in adults with intellectual and developmental disability sure uh sexually problematic behavior uh it it refers to any set of behaviors that are sexual in nature that are either uh invasive or to another person or illegal in nature this covers anything from child molestation, uh, indecent exposure, uh, voyeurism or peeping. Uh, could even in include something. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm I'm spacing on the name right now. Uh, we usually refer to it as like the the subway fondler, um, fraturism, which is oh. rubbing up against objects or or strangers like subways it's it you're packed in like sardines the rumble of the subway car some people gain sexual gratification just from the fact that they're rubbing against another person being sexually excited and the other person doesn't know hmm. um and then that goes all, all the way of course up to you know sexual assault rape um bestiality incest so any behavior that is sexual in nature is what we consider problematic um now we do often do some breakdowns when we're talking the difference between <clears throat> like children, adolescents, adults, usually the biggest background, uh, breakdown is we have what we call sexually reactive behaviors, which are people that are not predatory in nature. And this goes to like, let's say you have a very young child who witnesses sexual activity. 
they're too young to understand, they may mimic that behavior and appear as though they are acting in a problematic way. Oh my God, you get off your sister. You know, don't do that. That's not okay. That's not, you know, and the kid's like, what? I, you were laying on daddy and that was like, you guys seem to be having fun. So what the heck? You know, so now we have a confused child. We have a child who, who has behavior without context. So when we examine certain behaviors, you know, it's okay for a son or a daughter, like a kid to play doctor. That's perfectly normal. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I got something you don't and you're missing something I have. So what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very natural to explore. And we actually find a lot of similar or, or same age brothers and sisters who experiment like this when they're younger because they're just exploring biology. But it's our cultural mores and overreaction to the behavior that causes an adverse reaction when we're trying to explain this. So again, shame and guilt, shame and guilt. It, it creates shame and guilt which pushes behavior in, into a subconscious or, or a hidden level. <laughs> um, so <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. That's totally breaking me. That's great. I know. If I, um, if I don't pet him enough, he reaches for my nose hey, that I'm paying attention hey. to him. And then he'll, he'll swipe at my hand to get me to pay attention to him too. Hello. Still here. I know. Um, <laughs> but, but so that's, that's sexually reactive. And we usually reserve that to younger children may not have a context. For the behavior that they're engaging in so then it's purely education without judgment well you know we may start with well that's not okay to do with family because you know with family if you do something like that you might have babies and if you have babies with family you know you get a birth defects and it's not healthy plus that's not what a brother or sister does so then we reinforce family roles or we reinforce you know healthy ways to express that uh, but then when we talk about you know a slightly different version with some of my work with adults with disability, like the example that I gave you earlier about, you know, that parent, we have a lot of parents who are like, well, I'm not taking care of a two headed baby. And I'm like, we're just talking about your daughter going on a date. So they're holding hands unless her biology is vastly different from the rest of us. I don't think we have to worry about <laughs> children at this point. There's two support staff that are there like 24 hours a day, calm down. I understand your nervousness, but you know, I don't want to start the next family of Duggars either. Can right. we just chillax, you know? <laughs> so a lot of it is, you know, just getting people to be comfortable with sex and determine, you know, before we, we immediately assume that because the behavior was egregious, that it's criminal in nature. It, it's, I often say the job of a therapist is to be an annoying four-year-old child because I asked why every five seconds, oh, everything yeah. that you tell me, <laughs> that <fits>. why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, that, that's definitely, um, I, I would say one of the big things when we talk about the differences, it's all about trying to determine what it is appropriate or normative sexual development mm -hmm. versus what would be problematic. You know, the example I said earlier, it's perfectly okay for your son or daughter to play doctor. It's when they start charging for exams or forcing the patient, that's when we need to worry yeah. because now we're entering into, into criminal behavior or right more than exploratory behavior. Right. Uh, so that ties in pretty well to a question that we have from Onion and then Bite Mark and Alex, I will definitely get to your questions as well. Um, but Onion sent me a message on Twitter and they were asking um, if a couple have sex in front of kids ages five, seven, three, somewhere in that range. Uh, right. Is that appropriate? Is there anything that comes out of that? Um, are there any concerns in that situation? And it, the way that they were describing the situation is it was a frequent thing. Um, and it was kind of a, they were in the same room, not just walked in on their parents having sex, just like already in the room. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely I mean in my experience I, I would say it's definitely not appropriate to make it a frequent now I know that sometimes people have various Limitations, you know if you're talking about people in certain living arrangements where maybe you are all sharing one room You know, mm -hmm. especially in the case of younger children But the idea really is that the the way it's inappropriate is that like I'd said before a child is is visualizing and witnessing behavior without context so Again, and I'm trying not to get gross, but there is a certain freedom this field provides me with going, you know, this is like talking about groceries to me, you know, you know, I mean, some people within the throes of passion are quite loud and quite noisy. And, you know, so a child may misinterpret that as mommy hurting daddy or, you know, mommy on top of daddy hurting daddy, um, you know, or the noise that the bed might make or something could sound like fighting or 
and and a lot of it is that we don't want to give a behavior that the child doesn't have context for because children learn by emulation. You know, this is this is simple brain chemistry. This is mirror neurons. We learn by watching and repeating what we see. So now we've shown a behavior, a child is going to exemplify or replicate that behavior, and then they replicate it in a situation or a scenario where it's not socially appropriate. You know, the whole thing of, you know, people like, well, you know, that's disgusting. Get your hand out of your pants. Well, okay, I'm a three, four year old child. Man, that feels great. Right. So <laughs> I want to do this all the time. Um, but then I said, no, that's bad. Uh, no, what we mean to say is, that's bad to do in front of other people because that's a private yeah. thing. Yeah. It feels good and it's a natural bodily reaction. Again, person's personal faith, nonwithstanding, yeah, biologically, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's again, it's the context that we give children that's going to give them a healthy or unhealthy view of sexuality. Again, jumping back to the serial killer question, <laughs> uh, Al Albert Fish, he was a you know child predator, child molester. He would like shove nails into his groin because he was raised to believe that sexual feelings and all that were evil. And he was whipped and beaten by, by parents for this. So he had to subvert that behavior. Again, I can't guarantee that it would have been, you know, all aces and eights, but right. um, it, there is a lot to be said for children that young should not be witness to that behavior because they even developmentally, they, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. it, what what's going on and how that is and the, so yeah i would say that that especially at i mean at any age you shouldn't probably be watching your parents have sex if it's accidental okay occasionally you know like you said it wasn't wa walking in no it's not like oh, i think he's asleep let's do it you know you don't know and right. you know best to err on the side of caution um especially if you're saying it's like a consistent thing mm -hmm. that that i would say is highly problematic just in terms of healthy development yeah in one instance um not to get too detailed but in one instance you know onion was saying that they gave the five-year-old an ipad so that they could have sex in the same room um so Ugh. but i mean you know <laughs> and it I, sounded I like the younger hope. one maybe woke up in the middle and was in the same bed yeah. um which you know if i don't know I, I don't know i don't know the whole situation i only know this question related one so yeah i mean it's, it's one of those things that you're never you're never really sure how someone's going to interpret or um view the behavior that they're engaging i mean mm -hmm. let's let's look at our own different examples of the way that like if we see people interacting in the community in a way that's not normal i guarantee if you have eight people in a diner two of them start fighting you're going to have at least six different interpretations yeah of what was going on in that situation right not let alone the people who are having the argument you know what i mean so just best on air on the side of caution to just not not have that in front of children if you can at all avoid it yeah yeah, and we, we definitely had to have the um, don't touch yourself in front of other people conversation. And it's, yeah. we did, we we pretty much both just kind of reinforce anytime it happens. We have our youngest is, he just turned six. And so a couple years ago, he went through a phase where he was just constantly, yep. you know. And uh, it was like, look, I get it. Don't do that in front of me. Don't do that in front of anybody else. Yeah. Like that's something that whenever you're in your bed asleep or whatever, yep. that's fine, but not here. <laughs> Yep. Well, not in the living the room, room, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and dear God, not at school. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh, yeah. And why is it only when SpongeBob is on? Can we talk about that, please? <laughs> Sorry. Right. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions from the queue. Uh, Bite Mark asks, do you like cats? Love cats. Absolutely <laughs> love cats. We have fur, uh, three furry kids. That's why I'm laughing so much at the stunt cat over here oh my in, gosh. Uh, in the screen. Yeah, we have uh, we have three cats. We have Azriel, Zena, and Ozymandias. And uh, we also have a dog, uh, Izzy. Izzy Pup is his full name, named after, of course, a Izzy Pop. Pup. I love it. Yep. <laughs> yes, he, so we have a little cat um, <clears throat> play thing, like one of those carpeted with a tunnel and stuff over here. And if I'm, if I put him down off the desk and he still wants to be up here, he'll go and jump onto my shoulder to get onto the desk. <laughs> but right now he's getting, he's getting mad at me. And I only know because he's flicking his tail back and forth on the desk. He's oh, about to knock stuff off, but I'm, I'm, flick. uh, 
but I can't tell if he's mad at me because he wants me to pet him more or if he's mad at me because I'm not petting him right. <laughs> well, you, ne you never can tell no, with a cat. No, you cannot. They're, they're... You cannot tell with a cat. <laughs> Thanks, Morris, for making finicky an established set of cat traits. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bite Mark said we haven't had a tough time explaining that things aren't secret or shameful, but they're private. Yeah. That's a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to, to delineate, right? Especially with a kid, it is. you know, stop. It, no. It, you, usually it's, it's trying to explain, trying to explain like private is often a better word than secret because private's like something that you want to keep from other people because secret, again, in my trade, secrets are bad. Because, you know, secrets are, like, I can't enjoy kids' stores anymore. Like, I go into, like, on a roadside stand, and it's like, oh, look at this. It's this little bib, and it's like, what happens at Grandma's stays at Grandma's. Isn't that cute? And I'm like, that's not cute at all. That's horrible. Because <laughs> in my mind, it's like, what happens at Grandma's stays at Grandma's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one of the byproducts of working in the field this long. But secrets are bad that's that's how stuff gets you know undiscovered and how stuff continues on but yeah i agree that's a hard hard thing to, yeah uh, it is for teach. sure sorry i'm just throwing some treats across the room so he has to find them <laughs> and will leave me alone for a minute <sighs> oh, he likes to hunt thanks slay uh -huh. for that i appreciate it uh alex asks what is your favorite game and why is it D? &D? <laughs> It is not D and I will throw I will throw the covers of truth up into the air. Um, it, hard hard question. I, I actually have two. I would say two favorite systems historically that I can pick up and play at any given point in time, and uh, two or three current systems that are my faves. So my two of my favorite all time systems. One is the uh, Ghostbusters role playing game that was released oh. by West End Games in 1986. It is currently out of print, uh, very hard to find. Um, now this is partially because uh, I've seen Ghostbusters over 350 times. Uh, it's my favorite wow. movie ever. Uh, you'll actually notice that I have a uh, picture of the three original guys up there in mm -hmm. their commercial. I also have some art from the board game back here. I just bought a jacket with patches all over the place. Uh, but it was one of the first role-playing game systems I actually played for reals, where I like actually learned the rules and learned how to play, and that kind of sparked my interest in role-playing. Um, then Call of Cthulhu is probably mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorite systems because I love H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, I love the writings, and I've actually ran tons of different adventures in, in COC over the years. Uh, currently, I'm really digging Kids on Bikes, um, Doug Lewandowski and John Gilmore. It's like Stranger Things, the RPG. I've heard good things about that one. It's and it, he, They actually just came out with uh, Teens in Space, oh. which is like a sci-fi kind of adventure where instead of controlling a powered ally, you actually control a ship that you share ownership of. Uh, and you like use points to buy into like, well, I want a laser gun. Well, if you spend points to buy it, you control that laser. So when it fails, you narrate the failure. If it succeeds and you narrate the success. Uh, and then one of my other personal favorites is just a game called Retro Star, which emulates cheesy 70s science fiction. Um, and that was uh, Spectrum <laughs> Games designed by Barack Blackburn and Cynthia Celeste Miller. So it's just one of my personal favorites is it because I love, you know, I'm 47 years young. So I love my Buck Rogers and my Battlestar Galactica and mm -hmm. my Star Wars and my cheesy sci-fi. <laughs> so those, those are my favorite systems as of current. Yeah. I don't hate D&D. &D. I just played so dang much of it. And I'm really not a fantasy that's, guy. That's totally know? fair. That's totally fair. It doesn't have to be D&D. &D. I, I liked <laughs> Alex's phrasing of it, however. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, D.E. Bear says he really likes Ghostbusters. Retro Star is amazing, yeah. Get back to yeah. us when your watch counter is in the thousands. So my favorite movie is Labyrinth, and I have I have watched it over a thousand times. Oh, but, it's a great movie. But that's, be I mean, it's mostly because when I was a kid, I was two years old, and I, for whatever reason, was obsessed with it and watched it every single day for over a year. <laughs> Were you And similarly... I still watch it at least once a year. <laughs> Were you similarly obsessed with Dark Crystal? I don't like Dark Crystal. Really? Yes. Wow. I don't know. It just, it's just. It's got to be Bowie. It's got to be Bowie then. I mean, That's what it has come to on. be. It yeah, has to come be. On. <laughs> Most definitely. At least once a day. That's a good point. 
Yeah, dance magic dance. There you go. Uh, Alex says, how did you feel about the show Caprica? Um, I, I have to say that I am very much a classic uh, Battlestar person. I didn't, I, I didn't like any of the reboot. Uh, either of the new ones, whether it was uh, the new, I didn't mind uh, Battlestar 80, uh, mostly because it was still cheesy. It wasn't as good as the original Battlestar Galactica, but yeah, the, uh, the newer stuff I didn't really, I don't really care for. But this is coming from the man who currently is watching reruns of Sanford and Son, Jefferson's Facts of Life, like I'm a, <laughs> an, an Adam's family. Like that's, that's at least till the Orville comes back on that's what I'm watching right now. <laughs> there you go. We have been live for an hour, so if you haven't been drinking your liquids right now, water preferably, something hydrating and not alcohol, um, like Slay is pointing out there, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Dark Crystal either. See, see, it's not just me. Um, wow. I don't like the Bri I don't like Brian Froud's art style. This is my best guess for I don't like the Dark Crystal. Mm. I don't know. And I tried to watch it with a guy that I really liked at the time for the very first time, and I still didn't like it like still have it, no it positive is, associations with that <laughs> yeah it's it's like a different because personally i was terrified by the head come off people in labyrinth like they scared the bejesus those out were of me when I was one kid. of the most terrifying things in there that's for Ooh. sure but i love the spider crab walkie monster thingies mm -hmm. and dark crystal it was very weird yeah uh, so what co-occurring mental health disorders are most common in kids presenting with sexually problematic behaviors? And then also, same question for adults. Um, really, again, it kind of goes, I mean, I, I hate to seem like I'm avoiding the question, but there's really, like, there's not a standard that, that would occur. Because actually, mm -hmm. like, a lot of people go, oh, it has to be like PTSD and trauma because victims, you know, offenders were victims. Eh, only about 42%. Uh, they, they actually did a research study. Uh, they surveyed over, I believe it was about 5,200 people who were incarcerated. And about initially, I think it was like 84% of them are like, oh, yeah, we're victimized. There was part, we were sexual abuse victims. And then they kind of went back and they actually found that pretty much 40% of them were like, yeah, we we're just trying to get sympathy. Uh, for, oh, wow. for what we had done we weren't victims of sexual abuse and it's like that's again one of those big misnomers that people think well to to engage in this kind of behavior you had to have been of abused mm -hmm. now granted it's it can be a contributing factor sure but not not at all i've met just as many kids from perfectly well adjusted you know very high income very low income i've worked with them all there's no uh, well, they, they all have autism or they all have ADHD or they all have anxiety. They all have depression. And I'll say that a lot of folks, depending on what their circumstances were, <laughs> may develop some traits of, you know, things like PTSD and, and things of that nature. Um, but nothing that's naturally, uh, co-occurring that would mm. make a person more or less prone. Yeah. From what I've seen. That's, that's fair. Yep. Uh, is it common to have someone come to you who has been misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed for any co-occurring mental health disorder um, just because of the nature of sexually problematic behaviors and kind of the things that people seek treatment for? And they're like, yeah, we don't care about this other thing. We just want to take care of this. Um, honestly, m most of the persons that I have worked with were people that were uh people that were uh, involved with the legal system or the or mm. you know the like juvenile probation juvenile treatment uh human services in terms of like um you know like family and youth services or something mm -hmm. like that um so most of the time i i would say that the biggest thing that i've seen it's not really like a co-occurring thing but i think one of the biggest i guess the one of the biggest trends treatment wise that really can impact treatment that i've seen is the whole nature of i don't want to talk about it i just i just want to put it behind me so i don't want to ever talk about that thing and i'm like okay uh part of me agrees with you because we don't want to focus only on the on the bad thing because then you're you're focused too much on the on the negative aspect of the person as opposed right. to what we're trying to do which is build a positive self-identity mm -hmm. a success identity if you will um so it, it's a lot about getting the person to understand Yes, we have to talk about why you did what you did. That doesn't mean I'm going to remind you every day that you're 
a less of a person or you're a bad person. You're a person who made bad decisions. We have to figure out why you made them so we can hopefully help you not make them again. Mm -hmm. And part of that is be helping you become a better person or a new person that has things to look forward to. It's no different than using the comprehensive lives model. Let, oh, excuse me, thank which, you. Sure, which is something we use for like drug and alcohol treatment where we get a person to, you know, what what's meaningful in your life? What's important to you? Because when we have things of value in our lives, we're more prone to seek those things that are satisfying, but those also develop positive identity, which mm -hmm. is gonna pull a person not only away from criminogenic behavior, but it's also gonna put a person in a place where the biggest the, the biggest factor, I, I guess, with teens and stuff is probably social skills challenges, I guess, if I would have to nail one down, because when you've done this kind of behavior or this behavior has happened to you, you typically don't engage. And one of the ironies is that relationships are one of the biggest factors that leads to less recidivism in general, whether it's criminal behavior, sexual behavior, any type of, of behavior like that. If I get out of jail and I have people I care about, I'm less prone to break that trust with those people so I don't have to go back into the joint because I don't want to break those people's hearts. I don't want to hurt those people, whether it's a boss, your mom, your wife, your children, you know, whatever it might be. So I'd probably say developing social structures, especially for adults with disability. And that's mainly because most adults with disability in, in any type of living environment treatment wise, they really don't get as much socialization as the average person mm -hmm. um, for multiple reasons. One, they may be not knowing how to, you know, because they were kind of all their friends were mom and dad's friends uh, or just the people that they met at, at Special Olympics, which is great. Not knocking those social structures, but sometimes insular support groups create very insular people. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, did I ask this question? So Alex asked this question earlier. I, I think I might have skipped over it, but is there a phrase <laughs> you find yourself repeating often with clients because of how effective it is? Uh, probably my own personal mantra, which is this too shall pass. Hmm. Uh, it comes from my, my Buddhist leanings and my Buddhist, uh, um, uh, psychology leaning, but this too shall pass is just, yeah, you're mad, but I guarantee you're not going to be mad in like two weeks or you're sad. Well, the sad will go away. The anxiety will go away. Well, when don't stress yourself out on it, it shall pass. Right. Well, what if it comes back? That too shall pass. You know, well, life sucked for the last three months. Hey, maybe a month four it'll hit. And maybe a month four is when it will pass. You know, it's, it's, I, I'd have to say that that's the biggest one is just getting people to let go of attaching to anything because the more we connect and attach to something the more power we give it so the longer it sticks around we actually make ourselves worse sometimes by trying to oh, stop yeah. something that we should just let go but that's but again that's a very natural tendency that's not a positive or a negative you know i know i for sure do that make things worse <laughs> Oh, everyone does. I do it all the time. That's why I got, sure. that's why I got Buddhist mantras tattooed on my body. So I, it's like memento, you know, I kind of. It's <laughs> built in. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's right. Okay. Be more compassionate. Got it. Yeah, okay. Got it. <laughs> this too shall pass is my second most used meditative phrase. There you go. Second is nice, nice. Uh, do what you can with what you have until you get what you need to do what you like. Oh, I like that. That is absolutely wonderful. Do what you can with what you have until you get what you need to do what you like. That's great. I like Very that. nice. Yeah. Uh, so what are some things you help your patients develop or strengthen in themselves to address sexually problematic behaviors? Uh, Self-confidence, um, a little bit of reality therapy, mixing in some glass or there to talk about what, it, what do you want your life to look like in two to three years, so helping them you know, visualize what it, what is actually in their life and challenging them to just engage in new things. Um, you know, if you do, if you do the same thing you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always gotten. So, you know, a big part is, you know, uh, I always looked at treatment as, as a four pronged thing. I want to help the people I support rise. So one, I want to reinforce healthy patterns. I want to give information that allows for an educated choice. I want to support them in trying new things and trying things that they may not have succeeded in again. And the fourth is the most important, which is empowerment. You want to empower a person to do these things independently 
Um, cause my whole thing is if I'm, if I'm still your therapist after 10 years, I'm probably not a good therapist because you should, you shouldn't need me. That's my goal is to get you not to rely on me, mm-hmm. which seems to defy that a whole helper idea. Well, I'm just here to help people. And I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe I, it, I'm here to help you help yourself. And that, yeah. that I, I want you to tell me one day, thanks for everything. I'm going to go and have a great life. Maybe I'll see you on Facebook someday. Awesome. Let me know if you need me, but I'm if not when, let me know if you'll need me. Cause mm-hmm. I don't think you will. Yeah. So yeah, con- confidence, self-identity, success, identity, and just the ability to recognize and, and manage when things aren't going well, that eventually they will be. Yeah. I think, I think that that's a really good, um, good thing. And, and <clears throat> trying to work yourself out of a job that we've heard that here before too, just with the, like your whole goal is to kind of get to where you feel supported enough and you feel confident enough in yourself that you can make the decisions and move on with whatever is blocking your path at the time. Yep. Um, I think that that's great. Cool. And so, please let me know if I'm too verbose on any of these questions or if no, it's like, you've been you know, great. What, what's that Dutch phrase? My mouth goes like a duck's behind. <clears throat> you ever hear that phrase? That's no. Like a PA Dutch thing. It's like when ducks swim, their butts like, blah, 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 and they waggle. Okay, so it's, you know. My mouth, hang on, say it again. I'm writing um, this down. My FYI. mouth goes like a duck's <laughs> behind. I'm being PG for the for Is the it show. like a duck's ass? Oh, com- oh, wow. I could say the A. Yes, yes, you can yes. say whatever you want here. It was all, it was it's all fun. Yeah, Jack, you, you talk too much. Your mouth goes like a dog says. <laughs> I like it. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm gonna have to find a way to use that one at work tomorrow. <laughs> Trust me, my coworkers present uh, plenty of opportunity to use that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> should be good. Uh, yeah, we play cards uh, against humanity on here. There's, you know, <laughs> it's fun. Very cool. <laughs> Uh, so does tabletop gaming come into play all the time or is it on kind of a needs basis? Um, actually the, uh, tabletop gaming is, um, it's connected to the reason of like why we started Bodana. Um, tabletop gaming, I think, I think is a powerful additive to any type of therapeutic approach. It's it's more of a toolkit than its own modality. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not something that I always use currently um, in the sexually problematic realm. It actually, Bodana and the whole idea behind using therapeutic tabletop <clears throat> actually came after a pretty pedestrian use of, of role-playing games. We, at the time, we were all direct support professionals. You know, we were working on the unit is an RTF residential treatment facility. So we had like a floor of 36 kids. So we were like, eh, Saturday's one hell of a long day. What are we going to do with a 16 hour Saturday? And we were like, D and D like, cause we were all gamers. So, <laughs> yeah. so we were like, let's play D and D. And the people on the floor were like, all right, explain this D and D. So we're like, oh crap, here we go. Like, are we going to hear the Satan thing? Or are we going to hear the escapism thing? Like, what's it going to, you know, it's like a roll of the dice of why D and D is evil, right? So eventually the one that they settled on, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I just find it so hilariously uninformed was they go, do you really think it's appropriate that we're playing a fantasy role-playing game on a sexually problematic behaviors unit? And I was like, I don't, I, I literally, give me a breadcrumb, I don't follow. And they were like, fantasy, sexual fantasy. And I went, <laughs> oh, you got your Freud mixed in with your Tolkien. Okay, <laughs> two, two totally different fantasies here. This is orcs, goblins, elves, and dwarves fantasy. Mm-hmm. As opposed to Marquis de Sade fantasy. Right. Which, no, no. <laughs> But we do promise no chainmail bikinis. So after much Which would be ineffective, obviously. <laughs> uh, completely. <clears throat> so after much deliberation, we we convinced them to let us play RPG on the unit. And they at first it was like, well, the kids are gonna have dice and we'll collect all the materials. Well, they're gonna draw maps, so they're gonna like leave and escape. 
if they're going to run, they're going to run. We don't have a locked facility, so why are you even worried about it to begin with? This is not an episode of Hogan's Heroes. Calm down. Um, <laughs> that's my other thing. I make cultural references that are all before 1991. Just wanted to throw that out there. Um, but we eventually ran it, and and it, it at that point, it wasn't a deep therapeutic dive. It was literally the kids started behaving better obviously because they enjoyed playing and they don't want to be off level so they would ruin playing in the rpg mm -hmm. then we had kids looking out for other people because they wanted that player to engage in the fun as well and some of the like you know you're a cleric dude don't blow it keep yourself cool don't <laughs> step away don't fight him um but then years afterwards when we started examining role-playing games and potential therapeutic benefit we we actually got it through um rich thomas who is uh was a creative director of white wolf and he now is the ceo of onyx path publishing which does pugmire cavaliers mars tons of great systems yeah <clears throat> but rich actually uh supported the first save against fear and he was telling us about people over the years who had been using the world of darkness setting to conquer personal demons of abuse and trauma they've been playing against monsters healing the the, the hurt within so we, I refer to this as like my sun shone through the clouds moment where we are like, oh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what, oh, yes, yes. You know, that, that's when the chocolate hit the peanut butter. And <laughs> then we started to go, well, wait a minute. Let's start thinking about our own gaming. Because at this point, we, uh, the facility had already shut down. We had started Bodan as a training company but no one was paying for the type of training we we're offering because all the facilities were closing. Okay. So we started examining our own gaming and like what gaming meant to me as a child in a divorced household, whose, you know, parents are very kind of obsessed with fighting with each other and some of the other social struggles and challenges that I had, I started to examine what I played and who I played and why I played. And then everybody else in Bodana started doing this as well. And we started to say, well, wait a minute, if we got all that stuff out of RPGs and we weren't therapists back then, what if we injected the therapy into it with intentionality? What if we meant to do it this way? But again, it's not club you over the head with therapy. It's let's design a social challenge when you go to the marketplace or when you talk to the king or when you're taking the, 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 the job from Mr. Johnson in Shadowrun or whatever game you want to play. <clears throat> that's when we started going on this on this long road of RPG being able to be intentionally therapeutic and also board games. You, you can play a lot of board games that are intentionally therapeutic as well. I can teach a kid more about cooperation and collaboration playing Marvel Legendary or Castle Panic or Battle for Hogwarts then instead of some dry antiseptic group and it's like okay children remember everyone practice your reciprocal <laughs> communications today 10 apiece what no let's play this cool game where you're captain america and you're beating up dr doom but you have to talk to the other players to strategize how you're not going to lose let the game teach you don't have to teach let the game do it for you yeah. and kids will naturally gravitate so it it's something that we very much have we're just trying to find the right group to utilize it for sexually problematic because I mean, all the things you can do as far as like romance, you know, aspects to relationships and romantic entanglement and, you know, treatment of female characters and, you know, treatment of same sex or opposite sex. Like there's so much narrative potential for mm -hmm. talking about these healthy skill developments. So yeah. Hope that answered the question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Monopoly therapies are hating your family. Mm -hmm. yes. Frustration tolerance, yes. resilience, <laughs> and emotional management. Uh, no, ta see? no table flips, please. Look, there you go. Yeah, name it. Name a game, and if I know the game, I could probably tell you what skills it can teach. Risk. Risk. Uh, critical thinking, strategic forethought, uh, executive functioning in the four areas of the brain. Uh, as well as healthy sense of competition, some math, and uh, definitely resilience because dice hate you. 
Yeah. No. Oh my gosh, that is so true. <laughs> Whenever we go on um, family trips together, we always take a board game we've played together as a family, which is usually Monopoly or Risk. Those are the two favorites um, that I always win against my children. And <laughs> and then we take a board game we haven't played yet. Um, and so nice. that's always, that's been a, a really big thing. But it, we've gotten to the point where um, the kids are like, okay, but we're all going to team up against mom. Oh, like the goal you're, the first you're the goal ringer. yes but the problem is all of their all of their um teaming together falls apart so quickly <laughs> <laughs> it's like they one of them gets greedy and then it just all falls apart and i'm like mm-hmm <laughs> I, I love this Game of Thrones type of like imagining that like everyone around a table in this elaborate garb like mm -hmm. I will take Western Australia. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Unpopular opinion Monopoly is not even a long game if you play by all of the actual rules. That is very true. That is very true. Yep, yep. Um, all flesh must be eaten. Is that a game? Ooh, yes. All flesh must be eaten is a uh, horror zombie game. Actually, mm -hmm. horror games can do quite a bit uh to be therapeutic and beneficial um by providing with horror settings we can allow people to feel that they are conquering fears so we can represent fears through monsters uh we can also teach resilience critical thinking uh putting people in a death trap situation is a great way to develop cooperation and collaboration um mysteries and clue finding which also come up a lot in horror type systems uh <laughs> uh is 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 another great way a lot of people shy away from horror but it horror is very powerful because mm -hmm. it's so it's so emotional and evocative that yeah. you know there's reasons because even using zombies i mean it's a basic survival story what's better to develop cooperation collaboration than having to survive and mm -hmm. work with people that maybe you don't like yeah. like we have to deal with people we don't like in the real life it's right. you know this reminds me of a math teacher that could instantly tell you what to change for 20 watts for any amount. I like it. That's my family. I try my best to get my grandma on my side. Now, one time, one of my kids did propose an alliance with me. And I was like, okay, but if you break this alliance with me, I will destroy you first. And they changed their mind and decided that they uh, didn't want to have an alliance. <laughs> so, so you're teaching cause and effect. You're teaching consequences of choices and actions. You're also teaching uh, deliberation and, you know, conflict resolution. And, you know, you're also teaching don't mess with mama. Yeah. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the end result of any um, alliance with me has to be a draw. Like, that's the thing. If you make an alliance with me at the end of the game, we just go... We've destroyed everyone else. We're done. Good job, team. But no one ever wants to do that. <laughs> it never. Happened. I would love when you're when when uh, if your kids are old enough. There's a very cool game. If I can point you to, it's from AEG. It's a game called Cutthroat Kingdoms. Okay. Um, it it is pretty much kind of like it, it, you each represent a, a royal family in a royal house. It's a bit dark. Uh, Cause the whole thing is like, you're trying to kidnap resources and take over other kingdoms, but there's actually every king has like a secret child. So the decks also have an item, which is called the Royal pillow because you can blackmail other kingdoms by saying, I'm going to reveal your secret child. But if I have the Royal pillow, I can smother the secret child. <laughs> Oh, it's a, like I said, it's an incredibly dark game. I love but, it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very. And then there's this whole thing where like you're constantly amassing food for this great banquet, but the food are, are all basically face down, and some of them are poisoned. So you have royal tasters that can go through and and like pick out the poison. But the whole thing is the setup for the end game big banquet where you literally poison your entire opposition. So it's like. Game, game of Game of Thrones, like as a board game, it's an incredible designer. Uh, Brian Merlongi is a wonderful creator. Uh, it's it's a great game. Yeah, it sounds great. Game about medieval kingdoms with Ill illegitimate kingdoms, which gives the option to smother Chad with a pillow. Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty much. I wrote it down. I'm gonna look into it for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex had another question. Do you feel it's okay to go to therapy just in case you are not as mentally or socially healthy as everyone thinks you are? 
Uh, yeah, I, I'd say that that's okay to go to therapy. I, I think that as much as, uh, I mean, let's look at something like anxiety and depression. People are feeling that that anxiety or feeling depression and everybody's like, no, 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 you're okay. You're not, you're great. You're awesome. You can tell me that as much as you want. I mean, I, I personally have uh, ADHD as well as bipolar. So um, I heard everybody tell me how great I was. I heard everybody tell me how smart I was and how great I was at my job and all that. Like I hear all these things and I'm even now just kind of automatically like, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. You don't realize how terrible I am. Because that that that's what we do. That's what the process happens. You know, there's days I love myself. There's days I hate myself. There's days I don't trust myself. And it's okay if you feel that you need that extra level of support from someone that you don't feel is maybe in your hip pocket. Um, because friends and family, at least traditionally, should be supportive of us. And sometimes mm -hmm. even to our best detriment, and I know Bear's going to love this one, but, you know, everybody has a Stanford in their mind, you know, that imposter syndrome voice, that voice that tells us we're not good enough, that voice that tells us that we're never going to be good enough. And everybody faces that some more than others. So if you feel that you need that extra support to help you believe more, that there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's just another layer of support. And we decide for ourselves what support is helpful and beneficial. No one else can decide that for us. Yeah. So yes, that is perfectly healthy and 100% wonderful. Yep. Imposter <laughs> syndrome strikes again. Shut up, Stanford. See, I, see, I, see I, knew Doug, I knew Bear would love that. That was from one of the panels at Save Against Fear that everybody talked about imposter syndrome and apparently imposter syndrome's name is Stanford. So you have to just shut, shut up, Stanford. All right, there you go. Uh, by Mark asks, how do you feel about tragic horror games like Ten Candles where the intent is not to win? I love them. I I love I love games with a very sometimes realistic and dark edge to them. Uh, I mean, as long as we are preparing people accordingly, you know, trigger warnings, X cards, lines and bales, whatever we have to, you know, to, to make sure people know what they're getting into. But But I think that much in the way that gloom is a popular card game because not all stories have happy endings not all life situations do as well um yeah. we actually believe very much in the idea of fail forward um no matter if something goes the way that we want or if it goes the way we did not want no matter what it still went that way mm -hmm. and and part of that is that we have to find a way to move on or we just have to adjust with what the next thing is so I think that games that have that finality to them, I mean, RetroStar that I mentioned earlier, the whole system's D6s and it practically runs on failure it, because it, it's like in Fate or other systems where, well, I succeed at what I do, but I give a control of my character or I fail to keep control of my character. There's something very liberating about not succeeding, but still feeling in control mm -hmm. or... Yeah. Sometimes, you know, what, what do I say to some friends of mine where they're like, you know, I just, I'm just, I'm losing touch with everything. And I was like, <laughs> true control happens when you acknowledge that you truthfully have no control. There is no, there is, and again, my opinion, there is no eternal meaning to everything that happens in our lives. It's things happen. We attribute meaning to them. So part of that is embracing when things don't go our way and learning to manage them. So yeah, I'm, I'm very, 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 very in favor of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like to not have control over anything. <laughs> and so recognizing that nothing is ever under control is really hard for me. Uh, drunk rat. Thank you so much for that resub, man. I appreciate you so much. Love you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get you into the book. And I'll get my work into the book, and we'll do two giveaways at some point on Twitter. And I think that's a, that activates a sub only in Discord, too. So I'll get both of those activated. Watch from on Twitter. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit around the Bodana group and around Save Against Fear. But what drove you to – well, I guess you talked about kind of what drove you to start the Bodana group. Um, <clears throat> but can you kind of tell us what it's all about? Um, sure. Uh, so the Bodana group um... – uh, first, I'll define Bodana uh, because it's very central to what we do and what we originally wanted to do. 
Uh, Bodhana is a Sanskrit word. It means leading to an awakening or an understanding. Uh, so initially, we wanted to use aspects of Buddhist psychology with focus on things like the Eightfold Path and, and people getting healthy um, to kind of stimulate folks to learn and to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, now what it's actually subconsciously it means is that by playing the game, we want you to enjoy the game and engage the game that will lead to an awakening or an understanding that the player makes for themselves as client through the material. So what we do is we use tabletop board games, tabletop role-playing games for skill building, education, and therapy. So this is anything as simple as, you know, examples I gave earlier of um, we can use, you know, a game like uh, Mental Blocks, which is a new game that you have these foam blocks and a geometric pattern that you have to build. Now the trick though, is that everyone only gets one view of this construct that you're making and you can't share your view with another person, but you have to collaborate inside of a certain time limit to build this shape. So now we're teaching people about communication. We're teaching people about perspective taking. We're teaching, but, but it's just playing the game. So it's something as simple as that or teaching math through, you know, Monopoly or Payday or any of the other inordinate systems that use it <clears throat> to use of games for skill building. Uh, one of our favorite examples is we're going to be offering a workshop using a game called Signs. And the idea of Signs is it's this uh, card-based experience, which is based on uh, Nicaraguan children uh, who were in a school for the deaf. And they have no national sign language in Nicaragua at the time. So literally the whole experience was these kids created their own sign language out of necessity to communicate. Right. So the whole exercise is you play as these children and you have to learn through the game to introduce yourself to other people and to talk about things that are important to you. You can't use established sign language. You can't talk. Uh, so the whole thing is this incredible live action role playing simulation but think of how powerful that is to a person who's working with someone who is non-traditionally communicative. You know, now you understand, even for that moment, you know, experiential learning, you, you learn what the struggle might be to try and get your point across. If that's a bit too deep for you, we'll play Magic Maze. Great board game. You ever played Magic Maze? Mm -mm. It's this whole board game. You're four fantasy characters, and you, and you basically you lost all your gear in a, in a in an adventure. So you have to break into the fantasy kingdom mall, and you have to basically get the four heroes to the stores that contains their gear, mm -hmm. and escape the mall all in under two minutes. And the trick is each player gets a certain set of movements that they are able to do on the board. So I might only be able to move players to the right and up on the grid, you may be able to use the escalators and move them down. You have two minutes. You can flip the timer occasionally by landing on a certain spot, but you can't talk. The only oh. thing that you can do in the game, <laughs> yeah, that's always the way you go, oh, well, that's yeah. different. <laughs> right. uh, you, you have a red block of wood piece that's literally called the do something pawn. So you literally take this pawn and your only form of communication because you can't point, you can't grunt, you can't gesture. You only have to put the pawn in front of another player and they're like, what? Like they have no idea because you can't say, move the yellow guy to the right. Right. That game can also be very powerful because you're, you're having to communicate and do a combined task without the aid of typical verbal communication and feeling how limiting that is can give you a very unique perspective for people who don't speak verbally. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 you know, the biggest use of course is therapeutic use of RPG. So in this, we, we find out what the person wants to, to develop, how they want to grow, how they want to, what they want to learn. And we build it into the fabric of the story. So we'll build it in your character, your character's backstory, maybe the allies your character's playing around with, what the kingdom is all about, what your quests are, what your challenges are, and we're just playing a role-playing game. We'll throw some thought-provoking questions here and there, or if there's a, like a really dicey moment, we'll follow up. But it's not like, you know, this, these jokes I use in all these different interviews, like, 
you've just slaughtered an entire orc village. How does that make you feel? (laughs) You know, no, that's not fun. Like, that's not engaging for a kid. But when we have kids come to us and go, so I I see what you're doing. Like we're tricking them or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you want me to think about my actions before I do them. Do I? (laughs) <laughs> or, or is that just what you're getting out of it? You tell me, Bubba. <clears throat> we found that kids have really, really gelled to the idea of the narrative and driving the story. They want to continue that story. So if you're not going a certain way, well, there's NPCs that we play. One NPC is like the Jiminy Cricket. Well, you really should think about that, Pinoak. And, you know, then the other one's kind of like, bet you won't. Yeah, go ahead. Taunt the York Chief. Then I dare, I dare you. I dare you. Go ahead. You know, so we we can put any energy into mm-hmm. the story just through simplicity of play, and that is one of the main things that Bodana does. Is we run therapeutic services uh, at low or no cost to uh, children and families in need. We actually want to be completely community supported. So you know, if you're a car dealership or an insurance company, you know, for under for about six thousand dollars, you can sponsor a group for six children for a year wow. and that gets them their own rule book dice bag dice everything they need to then go to their flgs to start to make their own social network and their own base you know community natural supports um we want to offer after school programs we actually do run a ton of like board game social groups for kids on the autism spectrum uh we also run board games for adults uh, we went into uh, elderly homes and we turned wits and wagers into a game show where we like projected <laughs> the the betting board up on the screen and had everybody type in their, like we typed in everybody's bets. Um, so no one had to worry about mobility around the table or whatever, but we're all about two things, finding the right game for the right reasons and bringing characters to life. Those are our, our two taglines. So that's kind of go down in a nutshell. Um, we also uh, released Wizards, Warriors, and Wellness in March. This is our 43-page uh, primer about uh, therapeutic applications of role-playing games. So it's a basic overview of what skills we can develop and potential applications for different mental health disorders. Wizards, Warriors, and what now? And Wellness. And Wellness. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can uh, you can order it on Drive Through RPG. Uh, 15 will get you a print copy, five for the PDF. All okay. proceeds go directly to Bodana. Nice. Hey, that's yeah. a nice little plug. What do you yeah, think there? There you go. You get, you get a little plug. Yeah. Karitsu, uh, but, we've we've been talking. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. To, Here we no, go. No, no, you're fine. I, we've been talking to Jack Birkenstock. He is a co-founder of the Bodana Group. And we were talking earlier about sexually problematic behaviors in adolescents um, and in, in adults as well. Now we've kind of switched over talking about tabletop role-playing game. Also, thank you so much for that raid. I appreciate you and welcome everybody who came here with you. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that I didn't mention. Uh, we, we are planning on releasing more content driven for therapists and practitioners. Uh, we offer continuing education our trainings uh, approved by National Board for Certified Counselors. We have a, an introductory 5.5 hour training and then another one that's 7.0, which is about creating and implementing narrative content. So uh, we're actually fast at work at 301, uh, which is our workshop on developing adventures. And we're going to have that presented at next year's Save Against Fear. In addition to, uh, we do panels at, we were at Gen Con this past year. We do panels at local conventions. We run board games for local Comic Cons just to help spread the word about the mission. So there's a lot that we do at, yeah. at Bodana. So, <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> and, yes, and amazingly enough, this is all we've been able to do when uh, pretty much everyone in Bodana has a, a, a regular full-time job. So this is all after five and on weekends for yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, which is difficult to do. Uh, Kritzi says, I love the idea of role-playing games for people with mental disorders, especially since my older sister has Asperger's syndrome. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So you you talked about Save Against Fear, and it's kind of what brought us together <clears throat> here a little bit. Uh, so do you want to tell us what Save Against Fear is? And I know that it just happened, but it happens every year, right? So. Yep. Uh, so it's uh, Save Against Fear, which uh, again, kind of tying back to our earlier conversation, uh, what do they call that? It's we're going to 
bridge in the presentation, back to earlier things. Uh, but Save Against Fear uh, originally came out that after we had realized the training budgets kind of dried up, uh, there ain't no internet out in these parts, you know, uh, <laughs> little South Park reference every now and then. Uh, but we were like, holy crow, we're, we're, we're a nonprofit, we need money, because uh, hashtag nonprofit life. So we said, well, we're not really golfers. We don't have a $50,000 car to auction off. So what the heck are we going to do? Let's run a game com. We're all RPGers and board gamers. This was before we had determined our direction. It was actually courtesy of the first save that we had our talk with Rich Thomas that led us to this direction. And so save started 10 years ago, uh, and it originally was named Save Against Fear because our original intent, and we still have this is that we want people to save against the fear to talk about sexual abuse we want people to save against the fear to if you're a victim of sexual abuse come forward you know talk to someone if you notice someone is being hurt or abused speak up you know see something say something you know save against that fear so we can get a handle on this we also at the time we're running a board game event called meeples and peoples against abuse so it started 35 people at a local game store, six feet under games in New Holland, PA. <clears throat> it was pretty much their regular crowd and this young upstart Bodana. Um, <laughs> then we went from <laughs> 35 to 75, 75 to 100, 100 to 120, 120 to 125. That is a year we moved. Then, you know, we, we slowly were building up. Now this in our ninth year, uh, we went first from 213 two years ago to 402. Then this past year, we went from 402 to 498. So just too shy of 500. So it's growing. Um, and every year it never fails to amaze us. I mean, it's a three-day game con, mm -hmm. but it's a fundraiser. So people are like, you know, okay, it's a game con, you know, why is it 40 bucks to get in? Well, because that goes to charity. Like you're buying a role-playing game right. for a kid. You're, you're paying facilitators to <laughs> offer services for kids for free. Um, but it's three days of role-playing games, board games, tournaments. Uh, we don't have Magic the Gathering. We don't really specialize. We don't say no to cosplay, but it's very game-focused. We don't have bleep loop machines. Um, the only <laughs> video anything we have uh, is we do have an Artemis, uh, which if you've never played an Artemis, it's a starship simulator. So it's like you're on the oh, fringe neat. of the Enterprise. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but we even added a role-playing story to it this year. Uh, Amanda and Matt, the, the uh, folks who do our Artemis. Uh, so it's an incredible weekend. It's usually the second weekend in October. Uh, for the last three years, it's been at the Harrisburg East Mall. Uh, now, don't get frightened out there, listeners. It's not we're scattered amongst the entire mall. Uh, we're in an old department store. So we have 101,000 square feet of real estate to play around with. That's um, awesome. We have organized play. So Pathfinder Society, D&D, &D, Adventures League, Greyhawk Reborn. Um, we also have special guest designers that come and sit in on panels. Uh, we're offering also our professional trainings were there. Uh, we have panels on like religion and gaming. Uh, we had a suicide prevention panel. We had some authors who did some Q&A. Uh, it, we're looking forward to be the premier gaming event in PA. And again, every every single cent goes to charity. We don't pay all of it. And we actually run it ourselves. It's not like we pay somebody to run a con for us. Mm -hmm. We take the game applications. We take the vendor applications. We, we're there setting up tables and pulling out the 1500 uh, board game library like that's all spanned out there so the the weekend is incredible uh next year will be october 9th through the 11th <clears throat> and uh yeah we're looking to smash additional records and and to get as many people out there and we are looking for podcasters if you're interested okay <laughs> what are you what are you looking for podcasters to do if i if i know yeah. any you know <laughs> to to play interview you know people who are there uh, mostly to have fun and and talk about you know whatever gaming gamer life whatever you specialize in yeah well yeah. i i was already writing down the dates so i'm definitely interested 
<laughs> yeah. Heck yeah, sign me up. DE Bear, thank you so much for that sub. I appreciate you. And I you're new here. So um, I will just show you quickly what I do for the subscribers and then remind you that I do a game code giveaway with every um, subscriber as well. So we have now activated three game code giveaways this stream, which is awesome. But this is Subtris. And you get to cool. um, go into my little Subtris group here. You will go in as, oh, wrong side. Mental Health Monday, right there. And then if you resub, and every month you can resub, uh, then you get to pick what game you go in for. So Drunk Rat and hmm. Bite Mark almost always tell me to just pick whatever I want, or they go in for DBD or ARC, typically. So you'll go in for Mental Health Monday, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you. You only get one Twitch Prime, and I appreciate you wasting it on me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, no, Bear Bear is good. Is is great people. He's a he's a phenomenal designer. Wonderfully creative guy. I I miss him intensely. Yeah. Oh oh yeah. So what city? Uh, what city is the Saving Sphere in? Uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. Harrisburg, <laughs> PA. There we go. <laughs> Far from Wazel. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh uh, yeah, not a problem. So is there an overall well-being strategy you would recommend to anyone with or without an underlying disorder? Um, I, I would say that the, the biggest wellness strategy that, that, I, <clears throat> that I recommend is don't be afraid to challenge what your mind tells you because sometimes your mind is going off of maybe false information in for, I mean, for example, when I, when one of the main reasons I have a Stanford and I have an imposter syndrome is I, I fell prey to one of two camps when I was a younger child. It, one was the well intending, but still equally as damaging. You're not working up to your potential camp, uh, which is great. You know, you're so brilliant. You're so smart. You're so intelligent, you know, and it's like, okay, maybe I just haven't found what I like yet. So just let me like, you know, when I was a kid, like one week I bought the Klutz harmonica book to learn how to play C chord harmonica. The next week I bought the Klutz juggling book. Then I bought a boomerang book. Then I bought a charcoal drawing book. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do, but I, I just wanted to explore. But sometimes if people tell you you're no good or if people tell you that you're not applying or, you're, or we take these things and we can say we don't care as much as we want. But the more that you hear those, it's kind of like snow that piles on your roof. It, it lays and it layers and it layers and it layers and then eventually it collapses. So challenge that weight and look up there and go, yeah, do I really need all that on my roof? Like it's really weighing on me. And sometimes it takes a little bit of just, uh, it's actually called self-stalking where it, it's a horrible term for it. But, <laughs> but the idea is uh, it, there's actually, um, devices and apps that you can get for this it's it's a, a mindfulness spell is how i started doing it where it's this app you can get for free on your phone and it basically you can set it to randomly ring a chime so like every 15 minutes or you'll lose track of it or like randomly this chime goes off and when it goes off you basically just want to go okay um what am i thinking about right now and just spend some time with your mind don't judge it but just acknowledge what your mind thinks about most of the time if you catch yourself. And I blew myself away when I started this mindfulness practice because my mind was a mess. Like it was monkey mind at its purest, which it's a whole <laughs> Zen thing, right? Because because monkey is always grabbing for the next vine. Monkey is never focused on the vine it's on. So my mind was always moving too far ahead to be effective. So wow, if that doesn't sound like ADHD, right? So I, I started to slow everything down. I started to analyze my thoughts. And the more you spend time in your own mind without judgment, the more you're able to see these things at a distance that allows you to realize that this isn't saying that, like, I'm not really a good or a bad person. I'm just a person and that's a thought. And if I pay more attention to that thought, it's going to stick around longer. Or it's like a cloud in the sky. Yeah, it looks like a bird now, but if I just wait a couple of minutes, it'll stray over and it'll dissipate or it'll change into something else. Because the only thing that never changes is that everything always changes. 
And again, it goes back to impermanence. It goes back to this too shall pass. So I, I think examining and sitting with our own thoughts without judgment is probably the biggest self-help that I can give to anyone. It's worked for me at least. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, if you could change one thing about the mental health field or people's views of mental health professionals and educators, what would it be? <laughs> um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough question because sometimes I, I get uh, I, I think I get the ire of some of my uh, colleagues where I am not the most phenomenal research driven practitioner in the universe. It's not that I don't read research. It's not that I don't believe it's important, but I believe that training and experience should be just as valued hmm. as credentials and licensing. I mean, most of the time where people are like, oh, you're a therapist. Yeah. A master's level therapist licensed. I'm like, no. Oh, and I go, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> and, and again, at the expense of, you know, like, but I have, tw I have 25 years in the human field. Mm -hmm. I, like I've worked in many different populations. I've been running group for the better part of like almost 19 years. So I have a lot of experience being reflective and responsive and being able to notice changes in clients that I've, I've learned from DNA people. I've learned from people who use systems therapy. I've learned from people who use all these different modalities that experience is valuable. And I think that sometimes we run the risk of focusing too much on, well, what does the research say? What does the client say? Can we have that have just as much weight? Because if it says CBT and if I keep pushing CBT, if you're not gelling with CBT, I'm now doing you a disservice. Yeah, It's a great way to guide us, but it should not do all of the work. I think that, I, I, again, that, again, that might be a personal bug just for me, but you know, it's important, but it's not everything yeah. in the field. It should be a healthy balance as pretty much with all things, really. Yeah, I, that's great. So the, the next couple of questions are, can you come to Texas and be my new therapist? And also, can you, uh, is it possible for you to just relocate to deep East Texas in general? We need more people like you here. <laughs> and then I think the real question there um, is, as Bite Mark clarified, do you have any recommendations for finding a therapist that's a good fit? Uh, well, one, one of the things I said before was, you know, finding someone that you gel with, that you have rapport with. Don't, don't think... Like getting a therapist is not like finding a mechanic when your car breaks down. You know, when you when your car breaks down, you have to find the closest one. But in terms of looking for a mental health professional, you're paying for it, whether it's through a health plan or out of pocket. So don't be afraid to challenge, you know, and ask questions like, well, what's your what's your system of treatment? What modality do you use most? Or what is your approach to what you're what you're doing for me or what you're doing to help me and if that answer doesn't make sense to you you don't feel like you have to settle just because they're a therapist and this isn't to say that someone is a good or a bad therapist but i've worked with I, I, and again having my own mental health issues over the years i've seen many therapists over the years and i learned very early on with some people i'm like yeah i like what you're telling me but i don't like you Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and I'm sorry, I just don't get along with you. So I don't really want to sit here and pay to listen to you talk to me when I think you're being judgmental. And that might've been my youthful mental health, who knows, <clears throat> but don't be afraid to advocate for yourself as, and a lot of people say there's a bad word in human services field, but literally you're a consumer in every sense of the word. You're consuming it in terms of you're paying for it. You're consuming it in terms of swallowing what you're being given from a treatment provider don't be afraid to demand what you feel you need. And if it's not working for you, don't feel like you have, to, well, I'll give them a couple more sessions. It's okay to, to, to check other options. Now, again, health plans and all that stuff, notwithstanding, but I, but to me, that's the biggest thing is find a therapist that, that you agree with and you have rapport with, but also someone that is going to equally challenge you. Um, because a lot of therapists are, oh, you're not ready to talk about that? Okay, we won't go there. Well, if you never go there, you're never going to get there. 
So sometimes you have to have someone that, you know, like that good friend that we like to tell our problems to, as opposed to the friend who's like in the bar going, do you see what that person just said about you? Do you see how they looked at you? Man, they're totally like me. And they're like, we all have friends that we don't tell our problems to for definite reasons. Therapist should be no different because this is a person you're paying to tell your problems to. So same rules. If that, if that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about it before here, but just, and I know that your situation's a little different by Mark. Um, I know you're in between therapists and looking for a new one cause you moved, but, um, just like I've said it before, but the first therapist that I ever saw was horrible. I saw her for the five sessions that my EAP said I could have. Mm. And then I was like, we're done here. And now the therapist that I'm seeing now, like that was the best decision that I ever made was to get rid of her because the therapist that I see now is fantastic and perfect for me. Like what I'm dealing with right now and her style of doing things is perfect. And if I had stuck with the other lady, like I would, I probably would have just stopped going altogether. Yeah. So. Well, cause, cause sometimes if that connection isn't there and you're not making that connection with the therapist, it's no different from mindfulness practice. Like you mm -hmm. feel that you're, that therapy isn't working for you. And it's like, no, 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 the therapist isn't working for you quite literally. Yeah. So that's okay. Like, yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful example. I went, I went through that myself a number of times where I'm like, he, when CS1, well, you got to cut out smoking and this and this and this, and we got to get you to a holistic. And I'm like, what are you, Jim Goodbody? Like, are you a health guru or a therapist? Right. Like, what's right. wrong with you? But these toxins, I'm done. I see you said the T word. I'm out of here. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Baumgart asks, what advice would you give a new therapist or what do you wish you would have known early in your career? That is a great question. Thank you. Mm. That is a phenomenal question. Um, advice that I give a new therapist is it, don't be afraid to explore something new, um, but make sure that you know what you're exploring. Like don't, uh, and I'll give a reason why I say this. Like there's a lot of folks that we get requests for information for at Bodan and they're like, hey, I want to do this role-playing therapy. I want to do that. Where are my therapeutic modules? And I'm like, I don't know where are they like there's one that I know of <laughs> that's written and it deals with like anxiety Dr. Um, Dr. B Rafael Bacamazo uh, co-authored is called Gardens of Fog mm -hmm. and it's a great module but part of this nuance is write an adventure for someone craft something unique for that for that group that you're running for and the person says well what do you mean and I go hold on have you ever played a role-playing game before well no please don't do this or at least go play and find out what it's all about. And I yeah. think that like when I, I don't say that I use DBT, I'm not trained formally in DBT. I've read extensively on the, on the process. I've looked through all the material, like get knowledgeable about different alternatives because there's not only one road to go through. And most of what you do as a therapist, you, you I guess there's no other way to say it. get over <laughs> yourself if you're a therapist and and what i mean by that is learn the person that you're supporting learn the person that you're working with listen to them and let them guide the conversation a lot of people especially a new therapist is very full full, full of book learning and you know you want to just use all this wonderful research and all this wonderful technique and all this stuff that you've learned from your classes which is awesome but a lot of times you run into shiny new toy syndrome where you want to use this awesome thing, but it may not be what the person needs. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing is listen to like, they should be doing 75% of the talking. If, if you're doing more of the talking and I know it's ironic cause I've been running my mouth off for like the last two hours, <laughs> but this is different. <laughs> it's an interview. <laughs> ah, not a therapy session. Yeah, nope, nope, like, nope. Like, hey, yes. <laughs> But, but that, that's really one of the big things that, I mean, even early on, I, I started out being a very preacher-oriented kind of therapist where I was very like, well, I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to tell you a lesson. And in my day, blah, blah, blah. You know, and eventually I kind of like, I had a lot of those faces, you know, where people were just like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, so like the biggest thing that I wish I would have known earlier in my career was the humility it takes to become a therapist. 
And it wasn't that I went in thinking that I was God's gift to treatment, but it's that I went in with a lot of preconceived notions of what help looked like. And a lot of it was based on my own, what I thought helped me. Great place to start, not a great place to finish because I wasn't the client. So I think that that's one of the biggest things that if I had to impart to any therapist starting out is learn to listen and make sure that it you remember it's always about them. Yeah. Well, and, and that kind of ties to what you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, when do you use tabletop role playing games as therapy? It's kind of, it's not warranted in every situation. You have to see what the client needs. So if you have something shiny yeah. and new and you want to, you want to say, okay, well, we're going to do tabletop role playing game with the next person that walks in. <laughs> like right. that's, that's for you. It's not for them. <laughs> Ex exactly. Exactly. Well, cause even in that, like when we run sessions, we, we normally at this point we've learned over time to do the six month check-in. Everybody's still okay with their characters. Everybody's still okay with D and D. Do you want to switch? Because the first time we had it, like we were noticing that, you know, they like the adventure and everything, but they're like, do we have to only play D and D? No, no. I, I know tons of role playing game systems. We yeah. can play Marvel superheroes. We can play Pugmire. We can do shadow run. We can do whatever you want. And just that. Okay. So now let's examine like the character you're playing now versus the character you played then. Can we talk about why they're different? Can we talk about what you like more about this character now than you did maybe a year ago in your life and what's changed? So then the game is just a window for other discussion of therapeutic potential about personal change and how narrative arc and, and in reality we have a developmental arc. Like there's just so many possibilities that this model affords us. It's anything from narrative therapy to expressive therapy to psychodrama to, you know, it's, it's just so phenomenal. But yes, at the, at the very heart, it is about giving the person what they feel that they need yeah. and changing it if it doesn't work. Yep, absolutely. Um, well, uh, so I'm going to open up to any more of the community's questions uh, that you have. Be sure to use that exclamation point Q and put it in there. You're welcome to ask another question. Um, if there's nothing additional or kind of while we're waiting for more questions, do you have anything you want to bring up? Anything we didn't cover? Anything you want to throw up there about things coming up or work or research or shout outs or Ooh, um I'll, yeah, I'll give I... you the floor <laughs> okay okay <laughs> we'll give you the whole chair although you'll only need the edge uh <laughs> can you tell i love voices too yeah it's uh, great i love it uh well in, in terms of research we're actually uh uh at the apex of uh we just submitted a presidential research grant collaboration with the local university uh, to study the efficacy of uh, narrative role-playing game therapy with at-risk adolescents. We're looking at specifically targeting anxiety or depression in the research study. Um, we also are looking at our first private grant-funded uh, group, basically a local organization. Um, we're waiting to make the official announcement uh, that basically the arrangement I talked about earlier, they basically want to cover by a grant the cost of a group for six kids for a year and we're like this is awesome this is you know yeah. where we want it to go um we're almost ready to release our intentional use of board games um uh, wizards wars and wellness expansion uh we're also working on one that's about uh how to help kids start their own board game or role-playing game club uh so oh, nice. like sample letters to write to the libraries or how to get donations and like setting up rules for your club and whether you want you know, officers and stuff like that. Um, we're also uh, starting to branch out in writing specialized content. Uh, we actually, if you uh, go to our website, you'll see our little chibis, our heroes of the game. Uh, there are these little characters that we have that represent the various aspects that gaming can be beneficial. So, for example, we have Sagan the Fox, who looks very Naruto, uh, but he is uh, Sagan who represents critical thinking. Um, obviously named after Carl Sagan, uh, but what we're looking to do is we're going to create a source book for therapists and practitioners that each of our chibis actually has their own little world that they live in that represents the skill that we're trying to build in a person. So Sagan's world, for example, is, is a very Naruto-inspired kind of world where everything's a puzzle and everything's something to be unlocked or discovered and everything's like in codes and ciphers, which also lends itself to be like you know, secrets and corporate intrigue if you want to play more of an adult game. And it's all about how 
these branch riders who ride the branches of the Bodana tree, which is this big world tree, how they cross over into other worlds. So let's say, you know, Sagan, who has a pretty bountiful world he lives in, he goes to Ro's world. Ro's a dwarf who represents resilience. So Ro lives in a harsh world where the plants don't grow and the storms are always overbearing and we all live in caves and thatched houses that break down. So imagine what happens if Ro suddenly branch rides over to Sagan's world. So Ro's like, holy crap, dude, you got like piles of food. This is freaking amazing. He just starts grabbing everything and stealing. He's like, whoa, 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 hey, what are you doing, dude? Like that's stealing. And he's like, but the food's just sitting out. What do you mean? It's my people are hungry. So little, little ways that we can help provide, you know, a little bit of a leg up for like how to create therapeutically revel, uh, resonant and relevant stories. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're, we want to develop a ton of content. Uh, we also have our own uh, live cast, which is called Gaming with Intention, the Bodana cast. Uh, we maybe actually more Twitch that I'm doing, the more I'm thinking maybe we should start doing Twitch streams. I don't know how to do any of this, uh, but we review board games and role-playing games from a therapeutic perspective. So instead of talking about, ooh, the colors are shiny, the rules are great, well, this game really can teach this. And here's some activities that you can do if you're a teacher or if you're a therapist. Here's some ways to bring this into your practice. And so my buddy James and I, uh, who we already have about like 14 episodes under our belt. We got a little sidetracked, but... Um, <laughs> Is there a getting... website for that? Uh, if you look up uh, the Bodana Group Inc. or Gaming with Intention, the Bodana Cast on YouTube, um, okay. <clears throat> you know, all of our episodes are up there. We started with Evolution, and we've done a like I said, we've done a, a pretty good ton of them, and we're looking to reinitiate that as well. Very cool. Well, if you have any questions about Twitch, I am I am no um, expert, but I am here and happy to answer. <laughs> I, I think it seem I think it seems more difficult than it actually is. Most definitely. Like, also, yeah, you won't I'm like you won't have like half the problems that I have. Please don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> what if I have a quarter of the problems that you have? Is you know what? Happening? That's probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, that's Wait. good. Love what to see his reaction like I sent you in our DM. Discord DM. Wait, what is this? Is this safe to open? Is <laughs> this going to change the context of my... Here, I'll I'll put it in the chat. How about the <clears throat> sleigh? Is this safe to put in the chat? Can I put this in the chat? I think it's fine. I like a mystery. It's uh, I love you, Colonel Sanders. A finger looking... Finger... Licking good dating simulator. Oh my. I've okay. I have no idea what that is. And I'm a little terrified. Yeah, I, I am equally as much. So it's a oh, very no. it's very anime inspired uh wow a kfc dating simulator like what is what is Are even happening chicken? don't open that <laughs> alpha hey what's up <sighs> no the art is phenomenal i mean i love that i'd love to watch a cartoon series about the colonel features nine lovable characters multiple hours of playthrough dateable colonel sanders a secret ending Shh. double secret recipes Shh. cooking <laughs> battles battle battles Earn a degree from a fictionary culinary school. Culinary school. Eleven herbs and spices. Cute miniature foods. Originally created by KFC. No, really. The wow. most delicious dating simulator ever created. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to save that just for pure uh, Church of the Weird kind of purposes. Yeah. There you wow. Go. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's uh, that is deliciously bizarre. Says. Uh, Says a lifetime MST3K addict. Deliciously bizarre. That's a fantastic reaction to that. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> oh, just excited about the ability to date Sanders himself. Ooh. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I love how the more was, don't open that. Yeah. No, don't wow, do it. Okay. Don't do it. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you, Jack, for being here today. I so appreciate you. I have a, a whole... 
page of things that I wrote down. So. <laughs> oh no! Thank you. This has been abs- this has been a blast. Good, good. I'm glad. Um, chat, give me just a minute. I will be right back. We're gonna play some Seven Days to Die after this. So give me just a second to disconnect with our guest here today, and just know that we appreciate you being here for sure. Um, I know that chat always. The community always appreciates the opportunity to ask a mental health professional um, questions and everything. So, yeah, th- yeah, thank you and thank you to everybody in the chat. It was it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and again, I have some. If you're interested in some other interesting peoples, I have other peoples to uh, yeah. kind of you know speak it forward as as it were about other folks that have some interesting uh, things to offer about what they do. Yep, absolutely. Okay, chat. Give me just a second to disconnect with our guest. I will be right back. 